right. Hey, welcome everybody. It is Friday. It is 4 p.m. Pacific. It's time for Pathfinder Friday. So today we've been doing some lore lately with James Jacobs. Uh, we did an overview of Galarian. We did uh, some the 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 Rune Lords last week, which was amazing. I learned a lot. Thought that was a lot of fun. And today in the chat at that show, somebody mentioned the Starstone, and it was like, well, that's funny because we were just talking about that. So as soon as the show was over, James and I kicked back. We thought, hey. We should really think about doing the Starstone show because there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff in there to, to talk about. And when it came down to it, it was like, you know, if we're going to do this, we should probably get the very best for a show like this. <laughs> shh, shh, be quiet. I'm okay. talking you up. Go ahead, go ahead. Get the very best for a show like this. We'll edit that part out. Yeah, okay. And to do that, we've got ourselves quite the guest today. It is none other than Eric Mona, everybody. Hi! Hello, Yay. everyone. Hello, we, hello, hello. Eric is our uh, chief creative officer mm -hmm. and the publisher of Paizo. So you've been with the company for? The whole time. The whole Since time. Since day one. Yes. God help me. Uh, <laughs> so what we're going to do, just like always, we're going to talk for about 30 minutes or so. I've got a lot of photos here. Not photos. i got a lot of pictures. Um, and images to show off that kind of help illustrate what Eric's going to be talking about. I've got, this is the first time I've got extensive, extensive Free notes from Eric. Notes. You, you tell Eric, hey man, uh, if you can, can you jot down a few things and give me some images? Next thing you know, boom, I've got this. So it might go a little bit longer than 30 minutes we'll as far, but we'll see. But then we'll still do some Q&A and all of that sort of thing um, cool. about the Starstone and, uh, and whatever else comes up. So hopefully... You learn a lot. I know that I will. I'm, I'm anticipating learning a whole lot. So uh, anyway, so we'll get to this uh, presently. Eric, thanks yeah. for coming. Thank you for this having me, This is the first time you've been on the show since we've got the Paizo Studios. Yeah, I think the last time I was in here, I was on like a folding chair next to Logan talking about like the day after we announced second edition or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So it's, quite, it's come quite a long way, Dan. Well done. If you go back through the archives, there were, uh, there were some shows where I didn't have any furniture. Yeah. It was two metal chairs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and some microphones and and I think that somebody had canceled or something probably yeah um, and that was the first time I think you came on mm -hmm. and there was another time we were talking about something else and it was like oh yeah you should come on the show but it was we were still figuring it, was it back out back in the garage days if you will it was yes the garage days mm -hmm. um, that'll be the name of our greatest hits album I think that's a good idea yeah well, that's... it just came to me yeah. <laughs> let's make it all covers yeah okay. exactly good. so uh, anyway you were here to talk about the yes. star stone yes um, and now uh, I've been I put in the thing just for uh, in the um, in the the title of today's show and um, in uh, the tweet that I put out about the show, um, I put the Starstone Cathedral just because I wanted to make sure we were sure. covered just in case that came up. Sure. But mostly the bulk of this show is going to be about the Starstone. About the Starstone itself. Okay. The Starstone Cathedral is just part of the story and uh -huh. we'll get to that when we get to that. But there's a whole bunch before that. Okay. There's 5,000 years, <laughs> uh, if not more, right. of history uh, to go into it before we get to a cathedral. And that goes all the way until uh, Starfinder, still to this day, has a Starstone. Well, Star, Starfinder, yeah. Starstone also plays a role in Starfinder. And God knows how many years that is <laughs> from the current day. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. No one knows. Um, do you think that we'll be able to get to some Starfinder stuff? Or maybe. do you want to leave that out for today? We can talk show? a little bit about it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. So maybe, uh, Lori, possibly. Got a lot we'll of facts about to get through here. So uh, first of all, Eric, yes. just off the top of my head. Yes. Um, what are so we're going to get into some some history. I I, I believe the, yep. the start of that. Yep. Um, so outside of the story, outside mm -hmm. of that stuff, mm -hmm. what would be the beginnings of of the Starstone itself? That that's not lore, but more behind the scenes. Well, of that big picture. Yeah. Before we lose anybody out in Streamlands, <laughs> right. uh, the Starstone, what it is. Uh, is a uh, part of a giant meteorite that came down from outer space uh, in an event called Earthfall mm -hmm. that sort of ended the Age of Legends, the original sort of era of humanity's growth in the world of Galarian, and sort of set the stage for the modern day. Um, the Star Stone itself is an object that when you interact with it, you somehow become a, what we call a living god. Okay. Which is sort of Pathfinder code for a demigod, you know, <laughs> right. in game terms. Right. And so it is the the most obvious or the, the, the most uh, uh, available, I guess, method by which an ordinary person can become divine. Okay. Through 
a process known as the test of the star stone, which we'll of course get to much later. We'll get but to that. But broadly speaking, okay. the star stone is a artifact of significant historical um, impact <laughs> uh, on the world of Galarian. See what you did there. Right, right, right. Uh, okay, and so uh, and and this thing houses some properties to it that we. It's will got also some properties. Do. Yeah, okay. and we can talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, okay, so off the top of my head, that mm -hmm. I'm not reading off these extensive sure. notes that you gave me, Eric. What does this mean? It came from the pulp. Oh, What do you yes. mean by that? Okay, so a couple of things that are, it, it, let's go back in time. It's now 2007, 2008. Okay. Okay. We at Paizo are transitioning from uh, doing Dragon and Dungeon Magazine for the D&D brand mm -hmm. into doing our own product line. There was kind of an interregnum there during where we doing, uh, did some adventures under the Game Mastery brand. And those things eventually kind of evolved into Become Galarian. Right? right. So for a period of time, we were doing complete encounters, which were these like mixtures of miniatures and maps that had oh, short nice. adventures. Okay. And a couple of those are like um, Vault of the Whispering Tyrant and the uh, the Gorilla King features in those. <laughs> so we took nice. a couple okay. of key NPCs from the, those products, which were essentially just generic 3.0, 3.5 adventures, right. and started building those into Pathfinder. One of the other things that we were doing around that time, remember, knowing that our magazine business was over, mm -hmm. trying to transition into kind of like, well, what are we going to do next? One of the things that we did was a series of pulp reprints called Planet Stories that I was in charge right. of and that I was kind of the main editor for. And I've always been interested and obsessed with the old pulp history and, and pulp fiction from the early 20th century. And on top of that, uh, this company once published Amazing Stories magazine. So you right. go into our conference room and you've got every issue of Amazing <laughs> Stories that's ever been published it's from 1923 <laughs> to like, or 1926 to, you know, 1990 or something like that. Right, right. And so we live in a world that is heavily infused by pulp. And the roots of, you know, the D20 game, it, it goes back to pulp. And so at the time when we were starting to put together the, the campaign setting, I was editing a couple of books uh, by uh, an author named C.L. Moore. Mm -hmm. And she did a book called Northwest of Earth, which is about her science fiction character, Northwest Smith. Right. And then she also did a book that we published under the title Black God's Kiss, which is about uh, sort of a Red Sonia kind of archetype, like a fighting woman oh, named Jiro right. of Jory. Okay. Uh, and these were all published in the 30s, and they're, they're, I love them. Um, they're kind of like Lovecraft era. Oh, okay. You know? and, Are they um, kind of cosmic horror? Yeah, nice. especially the, the C.L. Morse is very much cosmic horror. Okay, cool. And so as part of those two collections, we published like a fun story that C.L. Morse husband Henry Cutner, who's one of my favorite writers, wrote called the quest or called the quest for the Star Stone. Okay. And, oh wow. Okay. Yeah. And so it it uh, involves those two characters crossing over. So we ripped it off. We were heavily inspired by the <laughs> name of it. So the Star Stone oh, itself yeah. has nothing to do with that with Perfect. that story. Okay. But it was like, hey, we need a name, and I was like, well, what about taking this sort of an homage to this pulp thing. Right, right. Um, which was kind of a mashup between sci-fi and, and fantasy. And even from the very beginning, we knew we wanted some of that in kind of hard-baked into Pathfinder. Right, And right. so part of the idea was, what is the sort of ultimate story of a fantasy adventure character? And it's like, well, yeah, it's the first level to 20th level journey, but it's also like, what's after 20th level? How do you become a god, you know? Yeah. And so we wanted to have something built into our campaign setting that answered that question right. that was right smack in the middle of the main city of our world, which is literally the city at the center of the world, Absalom, star stone, falls from space, boom, there you go. And so it came from the pulps, it Dan. came from the pulps, yes. and now I know exactly yes. what you mean. Um, and so, uh, uh, Skid, how are you? Welcome to the show. That's awesome to see you there, uh, Topper. Thank you for joining us. Um, so... Uh, that's where we got the name. The name. That's yep. the background yep. of everything. Yep. So uh, let's get into the beginning of this thing. Okay. Um, the, the Star Stone comes from outer space, yes. I assume. Yes. Uh, it came from the pulps, but also it came right. from outer space. Right, and it came from my head. You right. Know, so a compila compilation of all that stuff right. is a death sentence yes. for the people on Galarian. So essentially, um, we knew that we wanted to have sort of an Atlantis uh, analog in our world. Mm -hmm. And uh, Atlantis is sort of defined by a cataclysm that takes it down. So what's the root of that cataclysm? Right. And um, we, and by we, I mean primarily myself, James Jacobs, um, Jason Bullman, Wes Schneider, and James Sutter, I'd say were kind of the main architects of the, the original campaign setting. Okay. And we, you know, were particularly James and I, really interested in aboliths, you know, these <laughs> right. like ancient fish creatures, you know, that, that like <laughs> hate the gods and, and are always meddling in things, essentially. Yeah. And so we like the idea of, like, what if 
the abolists were behind the original rise of humanity. Um, because I didn't, once you get into like, oh, there's one primary human culture and it's like, well, which one <laughs> was it? And basically if you look into like real world lore, it's like, it's white people. And I didn't really love that idea, you know? No. And so like, I wanted to kind of bake in some corruption and crap into that original human yeah. empire in the first place. Yeah. And so why Give not it have dirt. it be the abolith who are like really the, the you know, <laughs> right. the culture givers of this you know, Atlantis. So, so the the abolists. The abolists built up Aslan, but then Aslan started growing too big for its britches, and so the abolists were like, "This experiment is a failure. Let's wipe the board clean." Okay. And the way they wipe the board clean is they call out to space, uh, and they oh, wow. start drawing okay. to the planet <laughs> a, essentially a giant meteor. <laughs> Of uh, of like an unborn planet, you know, that's in the solar system, uh -huh. and other accreted poisonous garbage, right. and we're like, bring it on down, <laughs> and you know that that uh, comet or meteorite or what I guess more like a meteorite right. just starts flying toward the planet, and it is the impact. So caught up in all that debris is this magical stone called the Star Stone. Uh -huh. Okay, so it creates all this chaos, and then there's a hunk of that nucleus left. Well. No, there's something we need to talk about before oh, that. Oh, no. Because Am surely I, if the Abolith... the head? You, well, a little bit. Because <laughs> if the Abolith were going to bring this giant, poisonous, heavily magical, uh, essentially space missile mm -hmm. to hit the planet, it was going to wipe out a lot more than just Aslan. It was going to probably wipe out the whole thing. Yeah, right? true, and, true. Or at least wipe out everything but the Aboliths or what have you. And so um, the... Aslanti were not without their own protectors at that time. They had a whole pantheon of gods. And two of those gods uh, stepped in to help prevent utter catastrophe. Well, that was nice of them to do. Right. And so those gods are Akavna, mm -hmm. the goddess of battle and the moon. Okay. And she, and her lover, um, whose name is, uh, as uh, I always say it wrong, Amaznan. Amaznan. Yeah. Amaznan. So, um, so Akavna starts by, by literally shifting the orbit of the moon <laughs> into the direction of this this giant cataclysm okay. okay so that takes much of the brunt of the the attack okay. if you will but it also just shoots a whole bunch of shards of space stuff through a cavern and just kills her dead She's so gone. she sacrifices Aww. herself to and a big section of Galarian's moon well, to yeah, block fair. the fall of the of Earthfall. Right. Okay? Right. Now, in the meantime, her lover Amaznan, yeah, is like no, <laughs> yeah, you course. know, like Darth Vader style. Oh man! And it, why it, it, would you do well, this? Okay. Well, maybe not Darth. I Vader can't style. believe you. But do he's this. like no, and he sacrifices himself to kind of uh, strip the poison and the magical energy for the most part out of this this missile headed for the heart of Galarian. Mm -hmm. And so that also kills him dead, thus paving the way later for Nethys, the god of magic, to kind of sweep in and take that mantle. Right, right. right. So a cavern is dead. A Mazdan's dead. Most of the brunt of this thing is blocked, but not all of it. Some of it still gets through. Okay. Uh -huh. So at that point, boom, it hits. Yes. And a lot of it hits straight onto Aslan, just mm -hmm. completely breaking up Aslan, sinking much of it below the surface of the, the sea. But a significant portion of it tears a gouge in between the continents of Garund and Avistan. Okay. And creates the inner sea. So the yeah, whole campaign absolutely. setting, which we call like the inner sea, that whole inner sea didn't exist prior to the fall of the Star Stone. So that segment that just gouged a hole and created the inner sea, you see it almost looks like a blast radius. Yeah, yeah. Because it is. Um, that, uh, that stone then is at the bottom of that sea and the whole world is cast into like a thousand years of darkness. It's a bad scene. It's in fact right, an age yeah. of darkness. And so this is like barbarism is at its height. The orcs come up from underground during this period of time. Ah, the elves okay. who had All warning right. that the Earthfall was coming, they're like, see ya, and they go through gates to a mysterious location called Soverian. Mm -hmm. um, and we subsequently know that that is, uh, they actually go to the planet Castravel. So they leave Galarian almost entirely. Some of them stay behind. 
Mm-hmm. And you can see in that image that you showed, a bunch of them are dying in that image. Yeah, uh, I think but uh, also, was it this one or yeah, the other that one. one yeah. That one, I think. And um, But a bunch of them like go underground to retreat and some of them become drow. So like the fall of the Starstone and Earthfall itself has huge implications upon mm-hmm. sort of the campaign setting as a whole. Okay. And so, yeah. So uh, among those things like the fall of the Cyclops empires, the fall of Thassalon, your friends the Rune Lords from previous weeks. Here, right, right. They get... They they kind of go into seclusion because they see it coming as well. Um, and uh, uh, it's even so powerful that on the opposite side of the planet in Tian Sha, Tian Sha. a bunch of volcanoes start going <laughs> off. Oh, nice. It's a, war- it's a it's cataclysmic. It's a worldwide event. cataclysm. Yeah. I love this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then uh, all of Islanti, they're all dead. Every one of them is gone. No, Dan. Some of them survive. What? Yes. And so basically, I had no idea. well, it's uh, you should read page two. Uh, no, but the uh, but so uh, some of them are not, you know, on the continent at the time that it falls. Some right. of them have uh, already. We'd establish that there are outposts in Garund and Avistan and stuff like that. Uh-huh. So there were some extant Aslanti who were not directly in the impact of the the Earthfall. Okay. Um, but some of them even who were managed to survive, you know, their continent sinking, they you figure out a way to not get swallowed by the sea, and there's boats, things like that. Eventually a human hero named Aridin uh-huh. uh, gathers survivors of the Aslanti Empire together on the the on a mountain, one of the few mountains that's still above the water essentially. The old one of the oldest mountains in the old Empire of Aslan. Yeah. And then they venture across the ocean, the Arca- the Arcadian ocean to Avistan where they start to sort of settle and start to eke out a life eventually founding the kingdom of Taldor um, and just kind of doing their best to survive during a very tumultuous period of time yeah Um, yeah. and eventually uh, Aridin um who becomes known as the last Aslanti. He is not yet a god. He's probably in game terms equivalent to what you might call like a quasi deity. So okay. he's maybe a little more than mortal. Like he he's not he's no longer aging, for example. He's oh, discovered okay. some magical. He kind of gets a, he he escapes Aslant with a lot of Aslant's best magical secrets. Okay. He's and a little so, like Bilbo at this at this point. He's got um, the ring. He's not aging at all. He's celebrating birthdays, birthdays, birthdays. Has a few magic powers, but we're not really describing what they are. I would say that the main difference between him and Bilbo, other than height, is that um, Aridin is like an active, adventuring hero. Right, right. So he's not the type of guy who like, oh no, I'll just stay home. He's the type of guy who is leading his people to survival, who Mm -hmm. is founding new kingdoms, who is doing everything he can to retain sort of the spark of the Aslanti civilization. The the, the not the evil, corrupt part, but the the, the parts that are true and and honest and what have you. Okay. And so eventually his experimentation and he's got a bit of a cult of personality at this point. Okay. But he's not really got, he's not a god yet. Right. And, but he starts to he feel a call uh-huh. to the inner sea. Okay. And eventually, about 5,000 years from the current era of the campaign. Okay, So 5,000 years after Earthfall. Right? So it's a while in the ago. middle of the 10,000 year gulf between Atlantis and modern day. <laughs> right. Or Aslant and the modern era of the campaign setting. Aridin travels to the inner sea. And he finds the star stone, which is on okay. the floor of the inner sea. Okay. And he raises the star stone magically out of the ocean or out of the sea. Mm-hmm. And at the same time brings with it this giant island, which is the Isle of Cortos. Cortos. Okay. And it is through interacting with the star stone. And we'll get into what that means in just a second. But it is through interacting with the star stone that Aridin becomes a living god, a demigod, a being who is capable of granting spells to his followers. Right. And so what had been a political cult becomes a cult that is religious in nature. Right. And at this stage, Aridin founds the city of Absalom as the hub for his cult, asks all of the people of humanity, so at this point he transitions from an Aslanti god to more of a god of humanity in general, having seen the heights of hubris and the depths of darkness that is the human story to date. Right. He's like, let's gather everyone together, let's share all of our magical secrets and kind of build a new community here, but then let's found this city of Absalom. So he does that, he brings up the Starstone Cathedral okay. as a essentially a temple 
around the star stone. Okay. But more important than a temple, it's a protective uh, measure. And so it is a full-on dungeon with traps and like it is a gauntlet that one must run. He had okay. to, of course, ra- find it, raise it from the ground. But all Aridin really had to do is reach out and touch it and boom, he's taking what's called the test of the, the star test. stone. Okay. Which we get to. Yeah. But he wanted to make that more difficult for other people. <laughs> so in, he's built this whole city. He's got this cathedral. The cathedral in itself is a mega dungeon, essentially. Okay. And bing, bang, boom. Aridin is part of Absalom's history for about the first 400, 430 years, somewhere in there. He helps the okay. city through the first couple of invasions that give it the reputation as a city under siege. You know, it's been sieged throughout all of history. Right, and right. Aridin himself was there to protect the city for the first couple, but eventually he leaves the city, goes on his own deific adventures in the great beyond, and does more god stuff okay. at that point. Um, yeah. And he's, you know, he's got followers and all of he's that got, sort of he's thing. He's got cults. Yeah. yeah. And uh, a lot of this Aridin stuff, incidentally, if people really want to delve deeper into it, um, is gone into in great depth in an article I wrote in Pathfinder number 100. Um, the, what, you know, Aridin, by the way, spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> Aridin's death, the death of Aridin is what actually ushers in the modern era of the campaign. So it happened about 100 years ago. The people of Cheliax are like, oh, the prophecy, because Aridin himself is fulfilling his own prophecy. He becomes kind of a god of prophecy. Right. They're like, oh, there's a prophecy, and Aridin's going to reappear in Cheliax, and it's going to be the most glorious era of all. <laughs> right. But instead, Aridin dies. There's storms that rack the, the whole planet for a while, mm-hmm. and uh, lots of stuff changes. And um, that is literally the beginning of the Age of Lost Omens, which is the current era of the Pathfinder campaign setting. So between that period of time, there were other people than Aridin who interacted with the Starstone. Right. And so uh, and so when he put this this dungeon together, the, the yeah. traps and all of yeah. that sort of thing, uh, it was immediately known how this is supposed to work? Like, was it? Well, I mean, I think that his cult most likely uh, was sort of explaining how it worked, at least mm-hmm. in mytho- mythological terms. Okay. So people have known about the Starstone as long as they've known about the Isle of Cortos and as long as they've known about Absalom. In fact, Cortos is the Aslanti word for Starstone. So another thing uh, is that you could call the whole thing the Starstone Isle if you wanted to. Right, right. Because right. it came up as almost as one. Okay. So then uh, people started taking the test, I assume? Well, yeah. So people are like, I let's, can become a god? Let's give it a shot. By touching a rock? I'm down, <laughs> right? And so the first guy uh, who gets excited about that um, is a warlord named Varadni Voon, who is a minotaur. Uh-huh. Um, we're now getting into stuff that <laughs> is not actually published yet uh, for Pathfinder, but that character has been known for a long time. Right. So what we're what what people will soon learn is that Varadni Voon is like a conqueror from Central Kazmaron, which is a continent right to the east of of uh, Avistan. Okay, and he's like. I would like to be a god. So he takes an <laughs> army of centaurs and harpies and they build a gate and just kind of come into the Isle of Cortos. And that's the first siege of Absalom. Okay. So from the t- year 23, so f- the year, the calendar starts yeah. at the founding of Absalom. Right. So within 23 years, which is the year of the, of the first siege of Absalom, mm-hmm. uh, someone's already going for Trying. that star stone, right? And I, probably even before that. I mean, how do you not? How do you I not? Mean, if you want to be a god, right? Yeah, I yeah. do. If and some, so- Someone and, asks if you're a god. You say yes. yes. And so, um, or at least you say, let me take the test of the star. <laughs> right, I'll, I'll be right back. Yeah. Right. And so how it works, essentially, is okay. you've got to get through, you actually have to come up with a with a sort of unique and interesting, so the star stone, which uh, you can, is in one of the the illustrations mm-hmm. of, the, of the cathedral, it's on like a like a, a tour at the center of this chasm that, that is like a, presumably like a bottomless chasm. Right, right. right. Um, and you have to figure out a way to cross over there that no one's ever done before. That's like step one. Okay. All yeah. right. So, so you do that. Just to get in the door. Cannonball yourself across, <laughs> slingshot yourself across. Right. Those have probably already been tried. So you got to do something. Unique, yeah. Dimension right? door. Sure. Maybe. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Who knows? Yeah. Check, I'm already, check the range. But I'm yeah. already thinking. So you get over there. You, you find a way to get into the cathedral. Yeah. Um, the cathedral is largely protected by like magical guardians, elementals, stuff that lives for a long time. Right, Illu- right. There's lots of illusion stuff in there. And then it's like a full-on dungeon, you know, and you've got to c- get through traps and monsters and stuff like that until you finally come to the chamber where the star stone itself is. Okay. At that point, it's not just like, oh, bing, I touch it, now <laughs> I'm a god. No, no. In right. fact, once you touch it, 
that's when like the test of the star stone actually really begins. Okay. And so what that is, is it's like a phantasmagoric series of images and vision quests and things mm -hmm. that are like inherent to the stone itself. So you kind of venture into the stone and then you go through a number of experiences that might maybe relive elements from your life, maybe are kind of like, well, what would you do in this type of situation? And it's really designed to kind of test what sort of God you would become. Okay. Essentially. But it is an inner test. So it's different for everybody it's different that for gets literally in literally everybody who gets okay. in. Okay. All right. And so for example, the the test that Aridan must have gone through mm -hmm. would be very very different than the test that the next guy who took that and that was like 3000 years after Aridan, right. 20, 2800 years something like that. And that's Norgorber, the Nor god of murder <laughs> and poisoning and stuff like that. So we probably had a very different series of experiences taking that test of the star stone right, than right. Aridan did or than the next god who did it after Norgorber. Gorber, who's Caden Kalian, right. who's this drunken adventurer. Uh, so arguably... Ascension Day was Tuesday, by the way. That's right. Yes. Happy Ascension Day. I hope, I hope you all um, had, had a good Ascension arguably, Day Arguably, Aridin was like a quasi-deity before he took the test. Mm -hmm. Nor Gorber, quite powerful adventurer when he took the test. Caden Kalian... Maybe it was a powerful adventure, but primarily he was just drunk. <laughs> right. So he sort of soft mastered his way through the whole thing and and passed it. Mm -hmm. So it it isn't necessarily and now getting through the dungeon part, very difficult. Getting through the test of yourself, you know, it, it isn't necessarily a high level challenge. Does that make sense? So yeah, anybody no, totally could do does. it. Um, it's and, uh, it's you know, your weapons. You, you you bring in there. What's in there is what you bring with yeah, you. Yeah, in a weird way, you're almost fighting yourself. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's, it's and a so empire. a lot of people don't don't make it, Dan. Understandable. Mm -hmm. What uh, if if there was a place that we could go as he turns the page to yeah. not everybody wins? Yeah. Uh, do you have a few examples of some sad souls that tried but failed? I do, but before I get to that, okay, let's talk about. One more person who definitely succeeded. Okay. And one more person who, eh, we'll see. <laughs> okay. And the, the one that we're missing that definitely succeeded is Iomide. Right. Iomide, who is the former sort of herald of Aridin, mm -hmm. uh, takes the test, becomes a living god, really takes on a lot of Aridin's church's responsibilities and things once he's dead. Right. Okay? There is another god who claims to have taken the test <laughs> of the Star Stone, and that is our friend Razmir. Definitely did. Good old Razmir <laughs> of the, the masked face <laughs> yes. of the 31 uh, steps. In fact, if, uh, and this is not uh, a call to do it right now, but uh, if people give bits to Paizo's channel, the mask of Razmir comes out and Ooh, says- uh, Not a know, call to do that. No, I, I don't want you to, right, right, but right. I thought that was a funny- So Razmir thing. also He's, claims to have taken the test of the Star Stone, right. because of course, He's a living God. Yes, all him. As all of God. his subjects will tell you. Right. And the funny thing about Razmir, though, is mm -hmm. like Norgorber, he even has pretty much open temples in, in Absalom because they're like, he's from this city, right? He did the test. Yeah, yeah, He's kind of ours to some degree, right? <laughs> right? Iomide, major temples in the city, major presence. Aridin, now he's been dead for 100 years, but even still, politically, his church looms large. Mm -hmm. um, Caden Kalian has got a church that has been burned down seven times and still <laughs> rebuilt on the same spot uh, because people keep getting drunk there. Right. Uh, well, you know, so, it's a bar. But Razmir, mm -hmm. not really known in Absalom as much as he's known in the coast of the Lake and Carthen, Lake and Carthen region, yeah. to the north. So did Razmir take the test of the Star Stone? <sighs> I don't know. There's some question about that. I we'll mean, leave people to carefully read the source material for themselves. <laughs> uh, no spoilers here. No spoilers here. Friday. But so, so it's it's a fun story to not know the answer sometimes. Well, you know? yeah, and it, it is kind of yeah, fun and to presumably play with there that. would be other people who have taken it in the subsequent years, right? Right. So it's funny in preparation for this conversation, I talked to both Jay, uh, Jason Bullman, mm -hmm. uh, who really helped. He and I kind of came up with a lot of this when we were doing the Gazetteer back in the day, right? And then with James Jacobs, who's creative director for the whole thing and has the whole picture in his head and it was like okay we know about these four guys who have taken this test like who else and James is like I don't think anyone else did it's hard yeah. and Jason's like I assume a whole bunch of other people did I don't know and so were there more I who knows there could have been there's an awful long time yeah and if they do succeed is there's no like fanfare no like, not necessarily it's only known if people decide right. to say something right I mean basically you kind of know it didn't work when mm -hmm. your would be god goes into the test of the star stone mm -hmm. and doesn't come out for a month and you're not getting spells 
when you're okay, there, him. There that's is like that. a pretty yes. good way to deduce <laughs> that your guy <laughs> is a failure. And yeah. if he's a failure, he is going to have a place in Absalom yeah. where he's remembered. And that is a little location known as the Shrine of the Failed. That is in the Ascended Court neighborhood of Absalom, right. which you can see on the, the title card there. Um, and that the Ascended Court is one of the earliest neighborhoods in Absalom. It's built around the Starstone right. Cathedral. Okay. And a lot of the city's temples, particularly of those gods who have taken the test, uh, are, are big there. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a very small temple there, however, where there's little niches dedicated to those who were not so fortunate as, say, the drunken Cade and Kalian. Right. And I would like to... Perhaps as a moment of reflection, I'd like to read the names of some of the... You know what? Yes. Okay. Yes, right. absolutely. So let's take a moment in honor of Caden's Ascension Day <laughs> to uh, pour out a little drink. And, and you know, if everybody wants to press F to pay the respects yeah, so I think that'd be as good. we go I think on. that'd be good. You can be... Now, press <laughs> F carefully because you might not want to respect all of these. Well, oh, then that's very, very so, fair. All yes. right. Here is a list of some of the gods found in the Shrine of the Failed. Demurin the god of sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Gobru, the god of fish and the bountiful seas. Delicious. Melag, the god of rot. Okay. Less delicious, perhaps. Yeah, well. This is one of my favorites, and I know it's Jason Bullman's favorite. <laughs> Ogo of the 16 poses. Uh, somewhere in Jason's notes, he actually has drawings of some of the poses, which is pretty good. Uh, oh, Plakis, go. the god of spoiled food and wastefulness. Oh, all right. Silmore, the god of blades. Spuhasta, the goddess of hallucinatory incense and herbs. Mm-hmm. Increasingly popular here in the Pacific Northwest. The <laughs> muted god, the god of silence and serenity. Yip Yari, the goddess of clouds and tornadoes. And Zimpar, the god of screaming fear. <laughs> I thought Zimpar was the master of the pan flute. Zamfir is the master. Dang it, I always forget that one. Dan, you so, fill up my senses. So those, the, <laughs> so those, that's from the Shrine of the Failed. The those Shrine of the Failed. Failed to yes, become. Yes, they were not successful. And so you may pray all you'd like to Yep Yari, the goddess of clouds and tornadoes, but your prayers will not be answered. Yeah. Now, interestingly, um, and this is just kind of part of the fun of the development of the setting, right. is um, there is a series of adventures in the Pathfinder Society organized play campaign that like zoomed in on the muted god, right? And right. so like there's right. a cult of the muted god even today in Absalom that's a bit of a criminal enterprise and there, we've done some adventures about that. So it's fun to see over the course of now the 10 plus years we've been doing this campaign, like something Jason and I just threw in a sidebar for fun then someone else really globs onto that and like mm-hmm. builds it. And it, I've been doing a lot of work lately on the city of Absalom, particularly trying to weave together all the continuity. It's been really fun to see how it's evolved in the hands of different authors. And stuff right, like right. Uh, interesting. So uh, let's see. Uh, there we go. So uh, after we've got all of these, uh, the ones that are in the shrine of the of the failed. Yep. Um, and then. Uh, the the big question is is why what, if they failed why do they get a shrine is it it's well it's not like the remnants of their like cult they're like yeah. would you please put this statue here <laughs> and then over I, time people oh, just stop I gotcha. coming it's like it's not so it's not really a so on the thing. one hand so let me go back to this because this is the the kind of the bigger image there yeah that's so the on the one hand you've court. got the shrine of the failed mm-hmm. but then also is there a spot where it's like people are like. I'm collecting to get oh, gear to real. go so and all that stuff. So you can actually stuff. see that on the illustration. There's all these tents and things in the kind of bottom right-hand corner. That's like the God's Market, mm-hmm. and there are like people standing on pillars proclaiming themselves to be the next God, and <laughs> right. you know people trying to gather followers and things. Because, of course, like Absalom becomes a religious pilgrimage site, not just for the followers of Aradin or Iomide or Ni- uh, Norgorber or Caden Kalian mm-hmm. uh, or any of the other gods who are heavily worshipped in the inner sea, but also for people who are like looking for something. Right. Right. And so there's a lot of people who are just seekers in general. And probably some of them eventually get there and out of some kind of religio mania or something are like, <laughs> the God I'm waiting for is me. You know, right. and then like right. plunge off the edge of the star of, of the, the chasm and die. Or yeah. Whatever. You know, yeah. but but yeah, you can go to that God market and you know, you can hear all the people proclaiming. It's like the scene from Life of Brian, you know, with all the different <laughs> prophets like standing yeah, around. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Covering and themselves if, and and if you intend to go and try to take the test, that's where you can tell people, hey, I claim these things in sure, my name. Sure, yeah, yeah. You can decide kind of what you're If you all care about. about these things, right. come join you know, me. It would be interesting that, like, okay, so let's say, for example, our friend who we've mentioned here a few times, Yip Yari, the goddess of clouds and tornadoes. Yeah. Presumably, 
uh, she's got some or he's got some personal connection to clouds and tornadoes, but then that would manifest in that second part of the test. Most ah, likely. Okay. Be like, oh, well, let's <clears throat> throw you into a tornado and see what happens. See, can or, you handle your... Right, right. And again, importantly, there's not like some secret intelligence behind the Starstone. It's it's a way to kind of delve into your own consciousness and stuff. So, Interesting. So you're not like... Let's talk a little bit about a mistake, Dan. I'm listening. Okay, so... We have not, and we have intentionally not, in published products, described what the test of the star stone is. Okay. Because we'd love to do it sometime, but we want to do it for real. Mm -hmm. Um, We did have a moment of, like, left hand, right hand, not communicating particularly well. Okay. In a little, little, little section in the book Mythic Realms, where it details a little bit about the test of the stars. So, and most of the stuff in there is innocuous and cool and, and fitting with past continuity. But the one part of it that just sticks in my craw as the <laughs> creator of the Starstone <laughs> right. and as the publisher and as someone who probably should have seen those pages before it went to press but didn't, mm-hmm. is the idea of like, oh, well, Aridin raised the Starstone and then the other gods elevated him to become a god. And thus, there's some mechanical suggestion there that, oh, if you want to do this Starstone, you know, in your own campaign, mm, okay. pick a couple of gods who might be your sponsor. F that. No. That is not how it works. <laughs> okay. It is, Aridin became a god because he embraced his own destiny and he became right. a master of his own prophecy, not because he tried out and the other gods were like, good job. Other gods don't give a crap about him or they wouldn't have allowed his whole empire to go down he is the one who grabbed divinity by the throat and made himself a god right same with norgorber same with kate and kaelian albeit maybe he can't remember yeah, well, same you know. with iomade same with rasmir i don't know jury's out but importantly that is just not how it works <laughs> and right. very very rarely am i going to step up as a publisher and be like we published a mistake but in that case you know hey if you like it do it that way. Right. But right. we will eventually. And that's maybe the big closer on the Starstone mm-hmm. is we will do it eventually. Like, especially in the last few weeks, we've been right. talking a lot about like what is the appropriate way to actually do the test of the Starstone. And so when we do it, it's not going to be where you're trying out for a democracy of other gods who are like, well, I give you a seven. So now <laughs> you're a god. No, it's going to be a test of your own metal essentially so the first part of the test of the star stone the dungeon part tests your character sheet mm-hmm. but the second part tests your character interesting right. that is really cool right. Right. um okay so does that bring us to a close at the well i think yeah for the most part yeah. yeah so like i said you know the question now is how do we get this stuff in the hands of players so that they can do it because people have been yeah, since absolutely. almost since the first day we said oh there's a thing called the test of the stars and people are like i want to play that let's do that yeah, and yeah. we'll do it the question is when and mm-hmm. how you know and so we've had conversations about like well maybe it's a whole adventure path or maybe it's a super high level deluxe adventure or maybe blur 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 so yeah i don't know the answer to that yet we're going to get there we're building a ton of stuff we have not gotten too deep into what we're doing with the campaign setting for second edition and all that. Mm -hmm. But let's just say we've been putting a lot of thought and effort into things like the Starstone and Aridin and Absalom and other parts that are just central to our campaign setting, but that maybe outside of the very first couple of years, we haven't really focused a ton on other outside of Pathfinder Society. So it's going to get pretty star stony up in here. Interesting. Very interesting. Yes, sir. Um, okay, let's do this. Let's do a sign-off. All right. We'll close this part up for YouTube, and then we'll start some, uh, some Q&A. With That'd be great. Chat. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. That was a fun show. It actually went way long, and I didn't even realize it because it was such a fun topic, and <laughs> there's still so much more to learn about it. So... Um, I want to thank Eric for being here, for giving all of this information to us. If you liked it, please, uh, we're getting ready to start a Q&A right now. If you'd like to be a part of that at some time, join us on Fridays at 4 p.m. Pacific at twitch.tv slash official paizo. And you can join in this Q&A that we're getting ready to jump into right now. If you like the video, uh, like our channel and uh, subscribe and hit the bell and all of those things, because then you'll be uh, notified whenever I put new videos up on YouTube, which happens quite a bit. Um, And in the meantime, for Paizo and for Eric over here and for me, I'm your old buddy Dan. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you next time. Bye.